Okay, so okay, everything's working. Well, first of all, uh, my name is Valentina. I'm a postdoc at Centra, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this seminar series for allowing me the opportunity to present uh, this work here in this seminar series, which, by the way, has a pretty cool name. So good job in choosing that. Uh, so this is. Uh, well, I'll be talking about the sort of spectrum of black hole quasi neural modes and particularly focusing on introducing the results of two papers that uh, I've done in collaboration with Victor, Kiriakos, Jose Luis, and Rodrigo, the latter two being in the audience. And uh, well, the idea is, well, first to give and general introduction to the quasi-normal problem in the hyperboloidal, as well as in the null slicing when that is uh, appropriate given the boundary conditions. And then I'll talk about the quasi-normal instability and the pseudo spectrum and how they relate to the choice of norm. And then I will talk about an issue that we've had with the pseudo spectrum calculation related to numerical non-convergence though the reason behind it turned out to be a bit more interesting than a simple numerical issue. And then finally, the last part of the talk will be an application of so spectral calculation to the analysis of the dynamical uh, instability of, in particular of exotic compact objects, but I'll be presenting tools that can be used to analyze dynamical instabilities in more general scenarios. So the geometries that uh, we'll be looking at uh, generally will have this uh, vacuum form with or without electric uh, charge or cosmological constants. And one particular example that we'll look at a lot is the Schwarzschild anti space spacetime, which has a redshift function with this form here. And linear perturbations on these spacetimes, which are spherically symmetric, uh, generally have uh, this form here, they follow a wave equation with some potential. The potential depends on the nature of the perturbation, of course, the particulars of the space-time and the angular multiple number. And R star is, of course, the total coordinate integral for all the redshift function. So quasi-normal modes are the analytic solutions to this equation that satisfy the appropriate boundary conditions that ensure that they decay toward the future. And at the black hole uh, horizons where the turtle's coordinate goes to minus infinity, we can impose a purely ingoing condition for these decaying quasi-normal modes. At, uh, infinity or at the cosmological horizon where the total coordinate goes to plus infinity, we can impose a purely outgoing condition. And we can impose these free wave conditions because potential goes to zero in these regions. And on the other hand, if we have time-like boundaries to our problems, such as the anti decider asymptotic region or uh, surface of some stellar object or exotic compact object, we have to impose other condition, uh, other conditions, and in particular for the ADS boundary and the exotic compact objects that I'll be discussing here, the boundary condition that we impose at uh, the surface is just a derivative condition or it goes to zero. And well, the solutions that satisfy these boundary conditions are generally in these limits of the tortoise coordinate, just uh, free modes. And a problem with them is that on a constant time slice, if they're decaying in time, that is with our Fourier transform convention, if the imaginary part of the frequency is greater than zero, then the modes have a divergence. In, limits where the total score that goes to plus or minus infinity. That is, the quasi-normal modes have a divergent behavior at horizon bifurcation surfaces, as well as at space-like infinity. And the solutions can be made regular in R star only if 
at these boundaries, only a t goes to infinity in a compensatory manner, as you can see just by the expressions of these modes. And this can be imposed geometrically in the space-time slicing itself by switching to a hyperboloidal slicing. So to our time coordinate, Schwarzschild's like time, we can add a height function, which basically uh, imposes this divergence of the time that bends the constant time slices in our new hyperboloidal time coordinates. And at the same time that we do this coordinate transformation, we also apply uh, compactification in the uh, radial spatial direction, such that we bring the interval between minus infinity and plus infinity to some just finite interval between A and B. And the conditions that have to be satisfied by the hyperboloidal slicing is that when R star goes to minus infinity, then the height function has to uh, be proportional to the tortoise coordinate. And uh, when R star goes to plus infinity, then height function has to behave like minus the tortoise coordinate. And when we have one time-like boundary, instead of just uh, two boundaries where R star diverges, then we can sometimes also directly use uh, no coordinates. So uh, tau can become uh, no coordinate, an ingoing no coordinate if we directly set h equal to g, so our height function equal to our tortoise coordinates, or the outgoing no coordinate when we set the same thing but with a minus sign. And geometrically, what we're doing is just this. So we're uh, changing from uh, slices here, of constant Schwarzschild-like time to these hyperboloidal slices. And when we have a time-like boundaries, such as uh, asymptotically ADS black holes, we can also use a no foliation. So we're using this, in this case, uh, this ingoing no coordinate as our time parameter, and in stellar objects, in asymptotically flat or asymptotically the space spacetimes, we can use the outgoing coordinate. And in the hyperboloidal coordinate system, after <clears throat> an order reduction in time, that is defining an auxiliary field, which is just the first time derivative of our uh, perturbation field psi, and a Fourier transform, the wave equation takes on the form of this eigenvalue problem, where the operator that uh, we have on the left-hand side is has this block form because of the order reduction in time, where L1 and L2 are just some differential operators that depend on our compactified radial coordinate and derivatives thereof. The particular form doesn't really matter for the purposes of this talk. And in the case where we can use a no-coordinate system, we don't need to do an order reduction in time. The equations are already first order in our time parameters. But uh, on the other hand, the problem becomes a generalized eigenvalue problem, where in this case, we have operators both on the left and on the right hand side that are just some differential operators in our radio coordinate. And the operator is ill conditioned to be inverted. And, turn this into a normal eigenvalue problem. So we have to stick with this form here. So after a discretization of our compactified radio coordinate on a Chebyshev grid and a sort of spectral approximation to the derivative operators, we can treat the problem numerically. If we calculate, for example, the eigenvalues of the O operator after discretization, then we get the quasi-normal mode frequencies. And this is an example of such a, the output of such a calculation uh, for a Schwarzschild anti deciderate black hole, where we've set the horizon scale equal to the uh, ADS length scale. And uh, this is the case of a scalar field, with angular number two. And well, of course, this being a finite rent approximation, we don't really resolve all of the infinitely many quasi-normal worlds. If we go beyond where this plot is, we get a few more overtones, and then we get some numerically non-convergent modes on the sides. 
but yes, we can get as many overtones as we want by increasing numerical resolution. So the whole uh, problem of the quasi-neural mode instability comes from the fact that if you perturb this uh, operator L, adding some small perturbation, and first of all, let me just say that if we say that the perturbation is small, then we need to measure it in some norm. And for most of the stock, we'll, I'll be referring, when I say the size of perturbation, I will be referring as respect to the energy norm, which is defined from this product here, that is related to the energy contained in the field perturbation of the constant time slices. That was first introduced in the original work on the several spectral quasi normal models by Sir Luis, Rodrigo, and Lamas, and then further developed in uh, this paper by Edgar and Jose Luis. And well, if the perturbation to the operator is small with respect to this norm, or whatever our choice of norm might be, then if the migration of the quasi neural modes in the context plane is greater than this value epsilon of magnitude of the perturbation, then the operator L is said to be spectrally unstable in this norm. And this occurs for black hole quasi neural modes. And the comment that I should make is that we consider only physical perturbations to the operator in practice. That's to say, uh, perturbations that only affect the affected potential of the problem without uh, changing any of the boundary behavior or the structure of the discretized derivative operators and all that. So only perturbations that can be feasibly related to a perturbative change in the physical background. And well, after such a perturbation, if we go back to the example above, the spectrum changes to something like this. So the red dots are the spectrum we had above. Uh, above in the previous case, and the black triangles are the spectrum after a perturbation of magnitude 10 to the minus 3 in the energy norm. What generally happens after this sort of perturbation, and by the way, the form of the perturbation is just a series of bumps in the effective potential in the form of this sine wave. And what usually happens is that often the fundamental mode is stable under such perturbations, but then from the first overtone on, you get some uh, degree of instability. In this case, the perturbation is rather small, so the displacement of the first overtone is not too large, but from the second overtone on, you clearly see the instability. That's to say, there is no uh, eigenvalue in the perturbed spectrum that is a distance of 10 to the minus 3 or less from the first overtone on respect to the original spectrum. And in fact, the perturbed modes tend to uh, form these branches that go out like this, uh, referred to as molar price branches uh, based on their seminal work where they found this behavior of quasi-normal modes migration after changing their potential perhaps somewhat an intentional way. So the sort of spectrum, how does this all relate to the sort of spectrum? Well, uh, sort of spectrum is a tool to quantify uh, spectral instability. And well, if we start with the spectrum that's defined by the solutions to this equation here, where omega are numbers of complex plane, and where these, uh, this determinant is zero, also the points of the spectrum. The pseudo spectrum is sort of a generalization of this notion that gives you a sense of how close a number lambda in the complex plane is to being part of the spectrum in this particular sense as defined by this operator here that is the inverse of the operator that we use to calculate the, uh, the spectrum. But now lambda is any point in the complex plane. And because it's the inverse of this operator, it's ill-defined when lambda is uh, part of the spectrum. And that corresponds to the epsilon going to zero limit of the pseudo spectrum. So the epsilon tending to zero limit of the pseudo spectrum is just a spectrum. 
and uh, for larger values of epsilon, then uh, this uh, notion, this uh, quantity gives you a notion of how close the point in the complex plane is to being part of the spectrum in this particular sense measured by this operator called the resolvent. And if this measure of closeness actually coincides with uh, distance in the complex plane, then the operator is spectrally stable and the epsilon sort of spectral regions form concentric disks around the points of the spectrum. But when the epsilon sort of spectrum contains points that are further away than a distance epsilon from the closest point of the spectrum, then the operator is spectrally unstable. That particular norm. Oh, sorry. So this is what the sort of spectrum of that example that I was showing of the scalar field in Schwarzschild ADS background looks like. So you see that the boundaries of the epsilon sort of spectral regions, which are these white lines, do not by any means form concentric circles around the modes. In fact, they are uh, open in the complex plane. And there's some interesting properties to be found in their asymptotic uh, tendency, in fact. Sometimes it's logarithmic, sometimes it appears to be polynomial, and, but it, it's always open. Explain that is, epsilon zero spectral regions tend to have infinite area in the complex plane. And of course, this is indicative of spectral instability. And this relates to the operator. Can, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Thanks, Valentin. Um, about the previous plot, uh, what does the, the color, uh, the, like the background color, um, um, refer to? So uh, what we've done for this plot is calculated the resolvent norm, this quantity here, in a very dense uh, grid of points in the complex plane. And the color is basically the magnitude of the actually the inverse of this resolvent norm and the white lines are just uh, level sets so lines of constant resolvent norm corresponding to the boundaries of epsilon sort of spectral regions thank you yeah and yeah of course i forgot to mention in the beginning but if you have any questions feel free to interrupt the presentation is not very long so there's that what caught my attention but I, I think you've said it here but i didn't get this why do you use the inverse and like the inequality on the other hand on the other side instead of saying something like the the standard operator and something like less than epsilon well yeah you could define it like that without the inverse but i mean it's equivalent sort of a standard definition i don't really know the reason why the resolvent is specifically called uh, the inverse of this, but uh, there might be a reason. Uh, it's the green function, so it's, it's the, oh, yes. it's the inverse. The inverse. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you for some reason. But yes, of course, you could. Yeah. Actually, you calculate, uh, as Christian is saying, the way you calculate in practice is um, by using if this is coming from an L2 norm. You don't inverse, right? You you calculate the norm of the operator and get and check that it's smaller than epsilon. In that case is true. <laughs> you don't need to invert. You change this. You change the the sign of the sense of inequality. Yes. So it's, numerically, we don't invert it. It's basically to save one step in the numerical procedure, but technically the definition that relates to the green function. But this is only true for, for norms that come from a scalar product. That, that, mm -hmm. that trick is only valid if it's coming from a scalar product. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, this relates to the operator perturbation that I mentioned earlier because there's a, an equivalent definition of the subspectrum spectrum that is uh, given by 
well, the set of all points that can belong to a, the spectrum of L plus some perturbation delta L, where delta L has a norm up to epsilon. We consider all possible perturbations. That gives an equivalent definition of the super spectrum. And one consequence of this is the fact that after a perturbation of magnitude epsilon, the modes can, in fact, end up anywhere inside the corresponding epsilon pseudo spectral region. And indeed, if we superimpose the two plots that I showed earlier, we see that the perturbed modes do indeed tend to uh, line up, in fact, with the boundaries of a particular epsilon pseudo spectral region. Though here it's not exactly evident. In other cases, it's more evident that they tend to stick to the boundary. So their migration, in a sense, tends to be the maximum it can be for any particular value epsilon as allowed by the, the epsilon sort of spectral region. One thing to note is that both definitions depend on the choice of norm. And well, in mathematical problems, when faced with spectral instability in one norm, one might want to look if into if there's a, another norm in which stability might be recovered. But in physics, we want our choice of what a large and a small perturbation is to be based on a physical measurable quantity, such as the energy. And that's why we say that uh, there's a physical instability because the spectrum is unstable with respect to energy norm. So, yeah, if there's any more questions, now would be a good time to ask them because this is sort of the end of the introduction. Explanation of what the solar spectrum is. And if not, then let's continue. So, what I said would be sort of a full picture of the characterization of the instability, except there is a slight issue with the calculation that I showed. And it's related to, well, it can be first seen through uh, numerical non convergence in the calculation of the resolvent norm that we use to uh, determine the epsilon sort of spectral regions. Particularly, what I've plotted here is the energy norm of the inverse of the resolvent operator. As we commented, in practice, we're using the inverse of the resolvent at a point in the complex plane where uh, it's not a part of the spectrum. It's just some random point with a positive imaginary part, which in our convention is the part of the complex plane where we have stable modes. And what we find is at this point that this uh, norm of the inverse of the resolvent actually doesn't uh, tend to converge, actually tends to zero as we increase the numerical resolution. As you can see in this log log plot, straight line fitting basically tells you that it tends to zero as some inverse polynomial then which should only happen for points that actually belong to the spectrum. But here, it, we observe a similar behavior uh, for, let's say, a lot of points where the imaginary part is greater than zero in the complex plane. Uh, so suggesting that something is wrong with the calculation. On the other hand, if we go to the other side of the complex plane where the imaginary part is less than zero, then we get imp an improved behavior of convergence. So we go to the lower half where unstable modes would reside and calculate the resolvent norm there. Then there's better indication of uh, convergence and it gets better the further down you go in the complex plane. Now some observations before everyone panics. The spectral instability of the quasi-normal modes under small perturbations is a robust result. What I'm talking about here is just a problem with how we characterize it with this particular calculation that uses the resolvent norm in our particular uh, numerical scheme. 
And another interesting observation is that uh, the solar spectrum at the finite numerical resolution does capture the qualitative uh, behavior of the spectral instability. But the epsilon values assigned to each contour line of the solar spectrum change with the numerical resolution and wherever this uh, calculation is non-convergent. Now, possible reasons for this non-convergence, on the one hand, it could just be that the operator that we are uh, using can't really be well approximated by finite rank matrices. And another possibility is that the points where we find non-convergence are actually part of the spectrum in some sense. And this, this is an important point that I'll get back to. But before that, let me just say with some semblance of generality that in light of this result, the way forward doing research in this topic is twofold. On the one hand, we need to further analyze the convergence of the sort of spectrum in different cases with different field perturbations, different space times, different norms, and understand better the reason behind the non-convergence. And then determine when and how quantitative results can be obtained from this calculation. And on the other hand, we can analyze qualitatively robust aspects of the non-convergent result and also obtain such as the shape of the contour lines, which doesn't seem to change, only the particular values of epsilon change when you change the resolution. And on the other hand, we can also obtain uh, quantitative results in the region of the complex plane where we do have convergence even in the energy norm, which is the part of the complex plane where unstable moles would reside. And actually the solar spectrum in that part of the complex plane contains some important information on early time non-modal effects in the evolution and can be used to gauge uh, the presence of instabilities beyond the neuron. So from this point on, I will briefly present the results of two works, one in going in each of these two directions, but uh, just say that both these uh, paths are still very much uh, open research programs. So the first result is on convergence of the solar spectrum particularly in Schwarzschild anti -Sitter. That's the reason I, why I was putting that particular example before, because I had the plots on hand for that. And the reason why uh, Schwarzschild anti -Sitter is because there is a theorem by Claude Wernick that uh, actually tells you that that point I made about the possibility of the points where we have non-convergence actually being part of the spectrum could in fact be the case. And uh, this theorem gives us a clue as to where those regions could be, where the spectrum is continuous, and where the regions are where the spectrum is discrete. So basically what it says is that in Schwarzschild's anti uh if we are working with a functional space HK, subleft space HK, which basically means that uh, the functions and up to K derivatives are L2. Then the spectrum is only the discrete quasi-normal spectrum that we know below a uh, line in the complex plane, horizontal line of constant imaginary part that is given by a constant and then the surface gravity times K, which is the degree of regularity. And above this band, all points are actually part of the spectrum. And because part of the spectrum is always continuous, then L is not generally a compact operator. And that could mean that it's not well approximated by finite rank matrices. But still, we might uh, find some improved conversion behavior in some regions of the complex plane if we impose higher regularity 
in our uh, functional space. And in practice, the way to do that is to add higher derivative terms to the norm that we use. Because all the quantities that we're working with are uh, determined by the norm, if we add higher derivative terms to the norm uh, and we look for finite quantities, that's basically imposing that uh, functional space we work with B H K. And in the hyperboloidal slicing, we've had some difficulties in obtaining better convergence results, even changing the norm in this way. But in the null slicing, we have found promising results in this direction. Now, I won't go into too much detail as to what exactly the problem is in the hyperboloidal slicing case. It has to do a bit with uh, order reduction in time and the block form of uh, L operator. But in the null slicing, where we don't do an order reduction in time, we did find uh, such a result. And particularly, uh, given the theorem, what we might expect is that in uh, so below a certain band, if we use the energy norm, we would have convergence, and above it, we would not have convergence, and that would indicate that all points in the comp in that part of the complex plane are in fact part of the continuous spectrum, and that is indeed what we find. The first such line is for the uh, Schwarzschild anti sitter case uh, that we're looking at here is at imaginary part equals two in the units of the horizon. So below this line, basically, we find convergence when we use particularly the null slicing, and above it, we don't find convergence. And this can be extended to uh, further analysis by uh, well, changing the, well, imposing a higher degree of regularity and looking uh, whether this improves the convergence in the second band. And we find that indeed it does. So this is an example of uh, some plots of the resolvent norm as function of numerical resolution, same as I showed before. So for a point that is below the first horizontal line I showed before, using the energy norm, we find uh, an improved convergence behavior. But if we go higher up in the complex plane, so above the first line that I show, then we once again find uh, non convergent behavior, which is fairly clear. By the way, when I say convergent behavior, of course, we can't know for sure. We only see up to where the numerical resolution allows us, but the tendency is there. Convergent result. And then above this first line, if we uh, increase the degree of regularity required from the functions by adding second derivative terms to the norm, then we once again find convergent results, even a bit higher up in the complex plane than we had here. But then if we go higher still and still use H2 norm, then we once again lose the convergence. And that's a remarkable coincidence with the theorem. And further bands can then be explored. And yeah, similar result uh, can be found there. So to summarize this first part, uh, the pseudo spectrum as defined by level sets, the norm of the resolvent operator does not always converge numerically. And there seems to be a strong relation between its numerical convergence and the degree of regularity encoded in the norm due to the presence of these continuous uh, regions of the spectrum. And the issue is still under active exploration, both in uh, asymptotically anti distributed black holes as well as in other quasi normal problems. And now I will I move on to. Question then. Uh, yes, please do. If you. Uh, it, a, a few slides ago, you said could mean. Uh, could mean? Yeah, you said you said the phrase could mean. You said that some, something could mean that you wouldn't be able to approximate numerically well, or that the or that the numerics uh, wouldn't converge. That could mean. So, so is it there? I mean, it's it's written on the slide. So, so um, mm -hmm. 
is it the case that you that like you really want to say does mean but you don't have a theorem to back it up is i mean what is that can you just expand on the on uh yes as far as my understanding goes which is not very deep it's it is what it says it could mean that i presume you mean this or where which which slide was that in that uh, maybe it wasn't actually maybe you just maybe you just said it in words maybe um, i just said it but in yeah, any so case you said it, it, it so you said the operator is is not compact and yes that could mean that so i think it's basically that that if it is non-compact then it could not be approximated well by finite rank matrices or it could be and it's no, not I, enough my I understanding is that, that to that yes well, my understanding is that it cannot be so to the so yeah, compact operator matters. is the closure of the of a finite rank operator so so you cannot approximate the operator but this act does not mean that is that the numerical I mean, the matrix approximations are not useful typically mm -hmm. when you calculate the eigenvalues um you don't if, if you have if you get increasing and increasing matrices you never get in the limit and a spectrum which is exactly the operator the one of the operator you have always uh, again values which are not but you you are somehow um a human being <laughs> so you are able, able to, to, to have this ability of empathic choice of a non non relevant uh, again values and you throw to the litter so we do this all the time so from the very beginning already when you calculate again values you know that in principle the operator uh the limit of the matrices are is not the definition operator but this does not prevent you from using it for uncalculated eigenvalues but you know that you can only trust a part of them but i think right. it's a when, proper statement when you say, so so i guess my my question there is when you say or when one says you know there uh that that's a theorem right is that yes like, i, can I, I think that's a, analysis but I can see that as a theorem somewhere i'm not an expert in in, in functional analysis but i think this is uh, in this case, uh, compact operators are exactly those that can be appro approximated by matrices and only those. Thank you. But this doesn't mean that they, they cannot use usefully. Yeah, the sure. that wasn't my question. Yes. So, thank you once again, Jose Luis. Uh, so... I, have, I may have confused everyone, so, so don't thank me. I might have said something completely wrong. So. No, no, I have to the responsibility. <laughs> you made complicated questions by computer. That's a classic strategy. Uh, so, yes. So, let me move on in the. I think I have like five, ten minutes left. So, let me just briefly talk about the exotic compact object analysis that we did prior to this whole convergence analysis and how that fits into uh, the scheme, uh, this broader picture that I'm presenting here. So, <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, let me say that quantifying the spectrum instability is not the only use that the super spectrum has. It can also be used to get information regarding transient non-modal behavior and uh, time domain evolution, as well as information on potential cellular resonant amplifications, sources, uh, we have sources in the system. And in this way, it can be used to gauge for dynamical instabilities when they're not directly evident in the spectrum. So all modes seem to be decaying in time, but non-linearly you see some instability chances are it could be encoded in the sort of spectrum. So it could have some indication of this instability from the sort of spectrum of the linear order problem. And as we'll see, this information for the most part is actually obtained from the region below the real axis where in fact the energy norm often suffices to give you numerical conversions. So uh, we could get clean results with the sort of spectrum in regards to these effects. So the example that we'll be following in our exotic compact object analysis is a previous analysis that was done in hydrodynamics by Trefetin, 
yes, more than 30 years ago now, where they were analyzing basically uh, the flow uh, between two parallel plates with some relative velocity. And this sort of system is prone to nonlinear instabilities, but if you look at uh, the problem linearly, the spectrum is, well, uh, here the Fourier convention is the opposite of what we had in our plots above, so the stable modes are in the negative imaginary part of the complex plane, and the shaded region here is a continuous spectrum flow of perturbations on top of this flow problem. And the lines are the contours of the epsilon zero spectrum. And in this particular system, what they found was that there's no growing moles, but there is spectral instability. And there's long lived moles, that is, moles that are really close to the real axis, so very small imaginary part, very long decay times. The sort of spectral contour lines uh, protrude into the unstable half of the complex plane. In this case, the positive imaginary part, uh, but in our convention, the, the negative part. And full nonlinear evolution seems to show uh, instability. Now, for the system that we're looking at here, particularly, it's uh, an exotic compact object that's modeled just by placing some reflective surface uh, a bit above uh, where the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole would be. So it's a horizonless object, a reflective surface, which is meant sort of to uh, disperse uh, any incoming perturbation as quickly as possible and potentially try to deter the instability in that way. But even these objects are to be unstable. And here is a plot of one particular such object where we're placing the surface at 10 to the minus 3 above the Schwarzschild radius in units of this radius. And we see that the problem has very similar characteristics to the hydrodynamic problem that we saw above. So there's no growing modes, strictly speaking. There is spectral instability. There's also long-lived modes. And uh, that is, modes that are very close to real axis. And there are more long wave modes, the more compact the object is. The sort of spectral contour lines expand to the unstable half of the complex plane, and uh, the full nonlinear evolution shows instability. That's sort of a generic instability of this compact object that has to do with the fact that if they're very compact, then if you throw a perturbation at them, uh, even if the perturbation is perfectly reflected, just from the vacuum solution outside, you could get nonlinear effects such as the formation of a trap surface that engulfs the object. So, particularly the protrusion of the contour lines to the unstable half of the complex plane could imply that, on the one hand, physically perturbing the system could lead to the modes shifting to the unstable half of the complex plane. So because the sort of spectrum seems to allow it, but it doesn't tell you whether it's physical perturbations or not that produce the shift. It could happen. Also, it could be that uh, initially small solutions in the time domains, so initially small perturbations, uh, have a period of transient growth and that is also encoded in the sort of spectrum in this region. And also uh, small sources could be sort of resonantly amplified. And all three of these uh, effects are present in the hydrodynamic system I mentioned, but what about this exotic compact object case? Well, the first possibility of moles shifting to the unstable half of the complex plane doesn't seem to take place. After a perturbation, the perturbed moles, uh, well, they do follow branches that sort of match the shape of the epsilon sort of spectral contours. Uh, but the fundamental mode and first overtones seem 
to be stable, in fact, and the more compact the object is and the more modes that you have that are long-lived, the more overtones uh, seem to be relatively stable to perturbations. And in this case, it's a rather large perturbation, uh, 10 to the minus 1. The second possibility was that of transient growth in the evolution in the time domain. And the time evolution operator, which is just the exponential power operator L times the time, uh, uh, the norm of this operator sort of uh, tells you the magnitude of possible growth of the perturbation. And this norm has a upper bound given by the price constant, which is just the epsilon going to limit to infinity limit of the ratio between the pseudo spectral of cesta, the epsilon pseudo spectral of cesta, and epsilon. And the epsilon pseudo spectral of cesta is just the imaginary part of the minimum of each of the boundaries of epsilon pseudo spectral. So in this plot here, the epsilon sort of spectral of CISA corresponding to this region, the, bound, the region whose boundary this line is, would just be the imaginary value at the minimum. And taking this ratio between this and corresponding epsilon in the limit of epsilon going to infinity gives you the price constant. And what we find numerically is that this ratio, in fact, just tends to one from below. Uh, as epsilon goes to infinity, that is, uh, the operator here seems to be bounded from above by one. And that is what happens when the evolution operator is contractive. So there's no transient growth. So, so far, the system seems to be quite different in these terms from the hydrodynamic system. The last thing we considered were uh, was the possibility of cellular resonances. And, well, indeed, having long-lived modes means that you have generically large values of the sort of spectrum on the real axis. And when you have a source term to the equation, so instead of just considering the homogeneous linear order equation, rather you have a source term, when you decompose it into frequency space, the degree of cellular resonant amplification of the source is in fact given by the norm of the resolvent, which is just a green function, as also we pointed out. And uh, so having large values of this resolvent norm on the real axis, uh, particularly around the frequencies that are contained in the source term, can lead to large uh, solar resonant amplifications. But of course, the instability in the exotic compact object case is expected even when the source is zero. But uh, what uh, we observed was the fact that if we go beyond the linear order, uh, in an appropriate gauge, the second order perturbations, the homogeneous part looks the same as the linear order. So it has the same frequencies and resonances and cellular resonances. But for the second order, because of the non-linearities of the Einstein equations, we have a source term which depends on the solution of the first order perturbation, the homogeneous problem. And if you do a Fourier decomposition of the source, then the frequencies of the source are proportional to the real part of the frequencies of the first order solution. And then, because of that, you can easily have pseudo resonant, uh, pseudo resonant effect between the different orders in the perturbation theory, which can lead to a breakdown of the perturbation theory. And that seems to be a way to characterize the instability of these objects. So, to conclude this part, the sort of spectrum of the linear evolution operator can be you know, used to gauge the presence of nonlinear instabilities. And the dynamic instability of exotic compact objects is not characterized by either a displacement of the modes to the unstable half of the complex plane after a perturbation, nor by non-modal transient growth, which is what happens in hydrodynamics, but rather it can only be seen in cellular resonances between the different orders of 
the perturbation theory. And the server resonances are stronger, the closer the quasi normal modes are to the real axis, that is, the more compact the exotic compact object is. And just to conclude the talk in general, the sort of spectrum of quasi normal modes can be used to gain insight into a variety of problems in, problems in gravitational physics. And due to the non convergence, when one uses the energy norm, this use is not as straightforward as might be expected, although this does lead to some interesting open questions, such as do we have to change our notion of what the quasi normal mode spectrum is? Or on the other hand, maybe change our notion of what the physical norm is that we can apply to the problem. And finally, just to say that all the projects mentioned are still works in progress. And aside from that, there's also many other open problems in this field, such as the sort of spectrum beyond spherical symmetry. So there's still a lot to be done in this direction. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.